John Latanzio. And what do you do? Uh, I'm a theoretical astrophysicist at Monash University. And you, what is your specialty? Nuclear astrophysics, structure of, and evolution of stars and how they make the elements in the universe, including those necessary for life. <laughs> All right. And uh, are we alone? Um, alone in the sense of intelligent things that we can talk to or alone in the sense of life of any kind? Okay, two questions. Answer each one separately. Um, in terms of life of any kind, I, I think probably not. There's probably some life somewhere else in the galaxy, let alone universe. Um, in terms of something we can talk to, mm, it wouldn't surprise me if we were, but to give a specific answer assumes more than I'm prepared to assume. So, are we alone? Uh, I just answered that. Okay. And what was the answer? <laughs> um, if you, it depends what you mean by alone. If you mean alone in terms of is there any other life in the universe, my guess is probably not. If and mean, why? Why do you guess that? Uh, simply because life originated here from what appears to be just standard elements that are seen everywhere in the universe. And um, I'm prepared to assume that it didn't require some miraculous event so I think given the, the numbers of planets that we're finding, it's likely that there is other life out there somewhere. How do you then explain the inability of artif people who are trying to make life to do so? Well, there are lots of things nature does that we can't do. It's not an argument that nature can't do them twice. So it's, it's sm the, nature is smarter than the chemists who are trying? Well, clearly. Okay, have you ever seen a UFO? spent a lot of time looking at the sky as a kid. I was pretty convinced I was being followed by Venus once until I realized that it was Venus. How long did it take you to realize that? Uh, 24 years. <laughs> no, I think I realized it before we got home. So an, half an hour? Yeah, something like that. So you were followed by a UFO for half an hour? In, yes, it was disguised as Venus. After you found out that After it was, I found out that they I lowered see. the Venus shield. So Has Jupiter ever there. followed you? I don't think, Ven don't think Jupiter's followed me. No, it's just because it's not as bright. Anything but else? it did make me realize that someone who was prone to believe would have convinced themselves that they were being followed by something and you would never have been able to persuade them otherwise. And you are not prone to believe such things? Uh, I think... You have to look to say, if these things were really spacecraft, then there would be some stronger evidence than something appearing to follow you and never leaving any physical signs behind. Well, maybe you're the one. That's a possibility too. <laughs> usually when I say, is it me or is it something else, it's usually me. All right. Have you ever been abducted? Not by aliens, no. <laughs> How would you know? Don't you think they could easily create an amnesia, induce an amnesia like they do in uh, Men in Black? They can, they can, that would probably require a pretty advanced knowledge of how our brain works. And I'm not going to say that it's impossible. Um, all sorts of things of which I'm unaware could have happened. So it's not impossible that you have been abducted by an, an, an aliens? No. And have anal probes and all kinds of things. If they did it all and erased my memory of it, then that's certainly possible. <laughs> I mean, now, this is not a very scientific discussion, okay. but it's certainly possible. <laughs> Yuri Milner donated $100 million to Breakthrough Listen, basically trying to use radio telescopes to search for extraterrestrials, so SETI program. Mm -hmm. uh, was that a good or bad thing, or what? It's a thing. It's a thing. It's not neither, neither it good or bad. It doesn't have a value associated to it. It's it doesn't. It's just a thing. No. So research doesn't have a value associated with it? tempted to say no. Hmm. I think research in general is a good thing. The, the, um, but not SETI. <laughs> I would like to see SETI define failure, which they don't seem to do. They've defined what success is, but they haven't defined failure. And uh, if they're just going to keep going, that sort of takes, starts to take it out of the realm of science even. Well, it's a big you can't falsify their theory, the, their, their hypothesis, that it might, we may have to look until eternity to find something. And until we do, not, you know, not absence eternity. of evidence is an evidence of absence. 
Well, not eternity, but maybe half of eternity. Okay. It's a big place. I'll take half of infinity any day. <laughs> All right. Now, if I give you a billion dollars under the condition of you have to spend this to try to answer the question, are we alone, what would you do with it? I try to find a way that buying myself a new hi-fi would, would help determine whether life existed in the universe. So you're so corrupt and, and you don't take this question so seriously enough and so you would do that. No, it was a flippant answer. Yes, My, it was a flippant, but that doesn't mean it's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> it's not going to help, though. <laughs> All right, what I would do, um, the thing that occurs to me is the universe is very big, the galaxy is very big, our solar system is very big. We can't actually go and do very much to anywhere that isn't relatively close. I'm not convinced that SETI is very useful. It requires an intelligence something like ours. It requires a technology something like ours. That, that may be right, but I'm just not convinced that it's uh, a good way to spend, say, a billion dollars. So what would you do with it then? Uh, I, I'd probably send a submarine to Europa. A submarine to Europa? Yeah. So you think that hydrothermal vents are the best candidate for the origin of life on this planet? Well, I certainly didn't say that, but I'm, 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 I think the whole area is sufficiently unknown that I would say that it's a very reasonable candidate without saying it's the best. Okay. You need a biologist to tell you that. All right, now you are a... Uh, you know about World War II Army tanks, so you like technology, mm -hmm. and... Uh, some people, for example, the Astronomer Royale, Martin Rees, has suggested that we should stop looking for life on the surfaces of planets because very soon we will turn into, our intelligence will turn into robots and robots will then colonize the galaxy. And so if other intelligences have done what we've done, they too would turn into robots after a while. With the singularity which is coming in 10 mm -hmm. or 20 or 50 or 100 or 1,000 years. Um, so uh, do you think that's plausible? And if that is plausible, don't you think we should be looking for robots rather than life on the surfaces of wet, rocky planets? Well, they, they're different. Yes, I think it's plausible. And yes, I think we're more likely to run into robots rather than people, something like people. Um, going to Europa is not, does not an attempt to try and find people. It's an attempt to try and find very primitive life forms or basic life forms microbes, maybe something like an animal, I don't know. Um, it's, it's not an attempt to find a, a complex civilization. But yeah, I think the, the, the thing that is too often dismissed or not discussed, not considered in these discussions is that, I mean, chances are a thousand years from now, we won't look anything like we look now. We'll, we'll be using biological and chemical and, and mechanical tinkering to um, solve a lot of our problems we may not even look like we do now and I also think this is a possible answer to the Fermi paradox I mean you know a thousand years from now our, our motivations may be nothing like they are now and it may be that we're not as interested in exploring the galaxy as we think we are now that's that's related to this idea that Carl that uh, Arthur C Clarke has mentioned that a sufficiently advanced techno, techno sufficiently advanced civilization is indistinguishable from magic and a fellow named Carl Schroeder said, well, no, no, he's got it all wrong. A sufficiently advanced technology is in indistinguishable from nature. Now, if Carl Schroeder is right, then it's going to be hard to find advanced aliens because they will be essentially one with nature in a way that only an advanced tree-hugging ecologist could define. So what do you think of those two visions of advanced technology would be easily recognizable because they've been chainsawing their whole entire planet versus one that, no, they'd be almost impossible to recognize because they will be so uh, ecologically minded and sustainable in maintaining the nature around them? I think it's impossible to choose between those or other suggestions that people haven't made because you have to understand the, the, motive, the things that drive the motives for uh, an intelligence that's alien to ours. We, can't even recognise intelligence alien to ours, quite possibly. So I think it'd be pretty hard to guess their motives. Either one is possible. Probably they both exist. Okay, how about the idea that, uh, you know, you're an astronomer, so you know about dark energy and dark matter. Do you think that has anything to do with alien civilizations? For example, could vacuum fluctuations and vibrations and the random seething particles in the vacuum, could that have anything to do with, uh, I don't know, aliens talking to each other? Could, but I wouldn't want to bet money on it. What would you bet money on? 
Very little. I'm very conservative with I money. See. I, see. Um, I don't know. It's a, that's a possibility. It's a possibility. But so dark energy could be the conversations that aliens are having with each other. That You said that. Yeah, but I'm, you said it's a possibility. I'm not denying it's a possibility. Okay. I'm not assigning a probability to it that's very large, <laughs> okay. but uh, it, 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 it could be. Well, how does that Many things could be. It how does that mean... compare to the evolution of human-like intelligence elsewhere in the universe? Well, that to, to me, that's a more interesting question. Why? Although, more probable? Barely, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I mean, it's true you have to define what intelligence is, and that's not easy. We just have to wait till someone gets here with a phrase book for us to refer to. But the, the evolution of intelligence is a very interesting question. It's, not, it's certainly not clear to me that that's inevitable. And... I know that's one of the terms in the, in the Drake equation, this F sub i, the fraction where life evolves and becomes intelligent. And I know that uh, in the 60s and 70s, people wanted to set that equal to unity. And it's not at all clear to me. I mean, the dinosaurs were here for a very long time, and they weren't very bright. And I don't think there's any evidence that they were getting any brighter. And they were around for 100 million years or more. So... So sometimes you, you break up the evolution of us into deterministic physics and chemistry and then this quirky, indeterminate biological evolution. So it's almost like two stages in the cosmic evolution of how we got here. Now, you study stars. Do you see any, uh, I guess, chancy random events in the evolution of stars at all? Or is it all deterministic? You put the simulation in and then you, that's what a star is going to do. I think it's all deterministic. Deterministic. Yeah. Well, Which well, doesn't mean that we can determine it, because it requires knowing how to model various physical processes that we can't do. But I think if you take two stars of the same mass with the same rotation in rotational distribution, the same initial composition, and you let them go, I don't think you're going to get much difference between one and the other. But the positions of the convection cells, for example, surely would be not deterministic. Yeah, but I don't think that's going to have much effect. Well, it might have a lot of effect if you, I guess, if, you're, <laughs> if your position matters to you. I'm a convection cell? Well, if you're a hurricane, for example, or a convection cell, any type of far from equilibrium dissipative system, they are not, you can't predict where they're going to be. You put them into your simulations, but you put them into in a very averaged way as if their details didn't matter. But somehow, to go order to get life, those details will start to matter, and I'm just trying to explore that uh, frontier. Now, one of the things I am prepared to put money on is that the distribution of convective cells doesn't have a big effect on the life evolving on a planet orbiting the star. Even and I haven't defined what big effect means. And so, so that's the plate way I'll tectonics, get out you don't think plays a role? Yeah. It does play yeah. a role. Yeah. Well, then the positions of those upwellings, the plate tectonic wellings that come from... Is well, that not deterministic, given the structure of the planet? I don't think so. It's, it's just like a big convection cell that comes from the core mantle boundary and creates yeah, plumes, yeah. such as the Hawaiian Islands, for example. Yeah. I'm just trying to introduce the element of non-determinism into what starts out as a deterministic system and then increasingly becomes... Sure, sure. I, I, I mean... The star is a different different thing. If you, well, if you because I, the energy output of the sun of the star really has very little to do with the details of the convection cells. As long as it transports that energy, I don't care whether they're, they're you know there's they vary in size by a few percent or something. You know, they have slightly different distribution. I know the bottom of the mixing. I know the top of the mixing. I know that the energy all gets through. Well, far viewed from a billion kilometers away, all life looks the same. Right? Yeah. And so you're looking at a star from a long way away and saying, oh, the details don't matter. You're averaging over those variables. Maybe. Maybe. Okay. Maybe. But, but, but certainly your point about the pl tectonic plates on the Earth, uh, that, I think that's, that, that's very valid. There's a lot, of, a lot of more random events on the planet, I think, than, than uh, in the sun or in the central star. Well, I'm just interested in this idea of you know, as physicists, we're used to dealing with, you know, if you do this, this happens. And, do this. and biologists say, no, you know, history and biology is just one damn thing after another. And there's this, that's yeah. a kind of a 
frontier between them, and obviously the evolution, the origin of life has to go through that frontier. So I'm interested in exploring that. Yeah. yeah. No, oh. I think that, that, that's, uh, that's very good and not taken into account often enough. Okay, you have, have you read the, or seen the movie Contact? Yes. Now, is my understanding in, in the movie Contact, uh, there's something special about pi. Now, pi is an irrational number that uh, has an infinite number of digits and therefore contains all the information in the universe. The Bible is in Hang there, on. the Quran is in there, your, all your textbooks are in there. It's like any infinite random sequence has all the information in the universe. It's just impossible to find because it's so long. So uh, I'm wondering, do uh, you think, oh, why don't we just study pi and then we can find out everything? This is another one of your games. <laughs> if, if the information is there and you can't get it out, why would we study it? Uh, pff, well, maybe you can try to figure out how to get it out. By rearranging the digits of pi <laughs> to, in a way that makes sense. <laughs> I don't we know. could just go and buy the book. <laughs> okay. Okay. How about nano aliens? What do you think of that idea? Tiny aliens that are all they're all over, they're inside your hat. They're all over me, and uh, they're they just live everywhere. That uh, stop that. And we just haven't recognized them. In other words, maybe uh, the solution to the fairing paradox is that life is everywhere, and we just haven't recognized it. So, what type of various scenarios? would fit into that. So something like the shadow life, there could be things that we don't... Well, that would be on Earth, but that wouldn't be alien that life. Would be Shad on... Shadowed life is other okay, types of life forms. evolution on Earth. Right? Yeah. But I'm talking about uh, life that has come from somewhere else and, uh, I don't know, is in such a weird form that we wouldn't recognize it. It's possible. It's possible. Would you have a favorite weird form for life? No. No. Okay. How about being inside of an alien? Do you think we're inside of an alien and we don't know it? I don't see any evidence for it. Okay, have you looked? Um, I don't know how to look. You don't know how to look? Uh, okay. I know that what, what looking we have done is consistent with us not being inside an alien and an extraordinary claim requires extraordinary evidence. Okay. So I'm prepared to, my hypothesis is that we're not inside an alien until you come up with some reason to think otherwise. But so, I can't prove that we're not. And, but, and you can't prove that it's an extraordinary claim either, I guess. Well, a slight pornography. I may not be able to prove it's an extraordinary claim, but I know one when I hear one. Okay. And that, that's an extraordinary claim. Now, let me ask you uh, an, um, an emotional question about what kind of alien would you like to find? Some people would like to find, for example, I've often heard that there are three types of aliens. One is the, these b aliens with big heads that will tell us all we want to know. And then there's the sexy aliens that you can have sex with. And then there are the reptilian aliens that are coming to destroy you. So. Uh, what kind of alien? Where, where's the sexy alien you can have sex with? Avatar. Didn't you see the movie Avatar? These are like oh, twenty I... feet blue-skinned, lovely beauties. Yeah, I, I blocked you... it out of my mind. It was <laughs> okay. too painful. Okay. So, uh, what kind you of? You know, al when we had our, our astrobiology unit, in about the third year that we ran it, we had a debate on whether SETI was a waste of money. Uh -huh. And one of the speakers said, "Of course, it's not a waste of money. We have to find aliens because then we can have sex with them." Yes. That was the first time I was exposed to this. I bet it was a young man. <laughs> it wasn't. It was a young woman. Really? And <laughs> I'm going to call, say it's the first time I've been exposed to that kind of thinking, although it's not a kind of thinking that I would like to dignify with the term. So what kind of thinking does your emotional brain engage in when it's thinking about aliens? And remember, it's not a rational question. I just want you to, hey, you know. Well, you, you want, no, you want. I want an emotional answer from you about what kind of alien you would like to find. One that I can talk to. So what's so it like English? to be inside your... English. No, 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 no. Anything. I don't care. You know. Any language. Es Esperanto, if it knows <laughs> it. If we could teach it Esperanto. Morse code, anything. Sign language. I don't care. But oh. for that matter, I'd be happy to talk to a fish. Okay, so you want to talk... Or a tree. You so, know? What... so what's it like to be a tree? That's why you want to you ask what's it like to be a tree? Yeah. How about I a mushroom? Like... You don't care? Like yeah, mushrooms? I'd like to ask a mushroom, How about too. bacteria? Yeah. How about anything. viruses? Anything. How about viruses? I, I, I'd be Convection happy to talk cells, to anything. Rocks. Convection cells not going to have a lot of stars? experience. How about stars? Would you like to talk to a star? Yes. I'd just like to know... A hydrogen atom. You'd like to talk to an electron. Look, I'm assuming at the moment, because for the sake of the emotional answer, <laughs> that these things will be able to answer, and they have enough awareness to be able to tell me what it's like. And they have a self. Yeah, I don't think they do, but if they did, it would be nice to know what it's like to spend your existence as a tree, or a cell, or a fungus, or a bacteria, or a virus. It would just be interesting to know. So reading novels is not good enough for you? No. Well, they're not mutually exclusive. I will read novels and when a star talks to me, I would love to talk to the star. I'll keep reading novels though. But sex does not play a role in this. 
No, I think having sex with an alien, as I said to the student, it would be like having sex with a spider. Does that really appeal to you? <laughs> well, how about the other, many people think that aliens are, have been around for two billion years more than we have, therefore they have these giant brains, therefore they know everything, they're omniscient, they're kind of like gods. And so, okay, we get to ask God, uh, how am I going to solve my, uh, my budget problem or all the problems of humanity, or as a physicist, you'd be saying, hey, God, what happens if I do this, this, this? And then this alien, uh, omniscient alien would tell you. Now, one physicist I asked that, he says, oh, I hope they're not like that because then they put me out of a job. Uh, are you concerned about that? No. So do it's you want... It's a fantasy. It's like Star Trek or Star Wars or something. It's a fantasy. This is not... It, this is in no way constrained by what things are like. It's just a fantasy of what people want. What people want. Some people want. And your brain has been constructed to do things like this, so why deny it? My, why brain, my brain doesn't want an alien to come and tell me the answer to everything. If it does, I'll say, great, you know, but I'll go and test it, see if it's right. But it's not... So you're a cultural relativist, like an anthropologist who wants to find out what the other side is like, the plants, the fungi, and you want to talk to them, yeah. but you're not interested in them bestowing on you knowledge that helps you survive better. I'm not, I don't object to it, but that's not my motivation for it. I think that's so unlikely because uh -huh. it requires... You, it requires the assumption that these aliens are going to be sufficiently like us and sufficiently technological that a meaningful communication about our technology or their technology would take place. If it does, that's fine, but I don't think that that's so very you're, likely. So you're in it for the communication, not, not the sex, not the wisdom, but for the communication in some neutral way. And the leather. <laughs> what do you mean by leather? <laughs> the leather. Well, this is from the Hitchhiker's Guide, right? Oh, when yeah. he asks the Vogue on why he does it, he says, well, it's the girls and the leather. <laughs> okay. All right, now you've been teaching a course. Uh, what's the name of your course? Is it The Universe life and Life? Life in the Universe. Life in the Universe. Now, of the, since you've been teaching this, what do you think are the, the students' biggest misconceptions about what you, the, the, the curricula, curriculum? Most of them assume that the universe, and in fact very few of them separate a galaxy from the universe, which I find a bit distressing, but most of them assume that the universe is full of planets on which there are aliens that are just like us but in a different body. A different body? Yeah, they don't assume they're going to look like us, but they assume that they're going to think like us and build telescopes like us. So like Hollywood portrays aliens? Yeah, there's a person in a suit. <laughs> you know, or maybe a digital suit these days, but a Homo sapien with a tail. Or something. Yeah, that sort of thing. That's that that that's how most of them see aliens. And um, by the end of the course, we've got to them to the extent that they they now think that anything is possible, and the fact that I can't prove that it's not possible makes it valid. And that's also <laughs> distressing. <laughs> like dark matter aliens. That sort of thing. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so do you have any advice for these students, full of misconceptions as they are? I think I would. L I like the fact that some of them start to think outside the box and don't think that all aliens are going to be like us. But I would like them to remember that they must be constrained by science and the laws of physics. Because we found no evidence that the laws of physics don't apply everywhere we've looked. So I think if you're going to try and hypothesise about life in the universe, you must be constrained by what we know about how the universe works. Well, for physicists, that's useful, but for biologists, how do you, how do you, what do we, we don't well, know the way... Biology is complicated physics, isn't it? I mean, it's still constrained by the laws of physics. Well, uh, one person said that, uh, you know, the biology can be reduced to chemistry and chemistry can be reduced to physics, therefore physics is the, the king. But my, my dad, I think, told me, he says, no, no, you got it all, all wrong because every physicist is a biologically evolved organism. So it all depends on biology. No. It does all reduce to physics, but in a sense that's not very useful. It's like all of physics is G equals 8 pi T, right? Contains everything, but it's, as a friend of mine, colleague said, it's an example of the powerful principle that the more powerful a principle, the less practical use it is. <laughs> It's like Feynman putting all the equations in the universe into one all on the left side of something and then equals zero. That's right. F minus MA equals zero. Yeah. E minus MC squared. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. All right. Um, so but I think that, the, I mean, the biology does, of course, reduce to physics, but they deal with systems that are so much more complex that it, it may not be immediately obvious that, that there's a particular physical law involved. But, but the I'm game sure we're trying are. to do, figure out, though, is, is has life originated elsewhere? Now, 
now you're teaching life in the universe. You're, you're a physicist. How in the world, why are you teaching this course? You don't know anything about biology. If it's a biological question. Well, I know a little bit about biology. We have to, know, have to get the initial conditions right. You still have to, you, you can't have life, life, as far as we know, it can't spontaneously arise without having uh, the elements around and uh, energy input and uh, the right environment. And that's the sort of thing that we deal with. When we get to the biological part, we bring in some tame biologists who help us with that. Mm. So what about Boltzmann brains? Do you, have you heard about those? No. Boltzmann brains are when you have vacuum, you have an infinite universe that lasts for an infinite time and then you have vacuum fluctuations. Right. So fl we don't have to consider it because our universe is neither in infinite, neither in space nor time. We think it is both. We do? Yes, we do. Oh, it's flat, yes, the universe maybe, is yes. flat, therefore it's consistent with being infinite and it just goes on and on forever. In time, there's no reason we don't expect to be a big it, crunch, yeah, therefore yeah. you do have those conditions. Yeah. Well, well, under those conditions, you're vacuum dominated and then you have vacuum fluctuations and then you fluctuate into Boltzmann brains, which are self-aware quantum vacuum fluctuations and then they come into existence and go out of existence. This is called the, the Boltzmann vacuum, Boltzmann you're brain problem. one of your games again, Charles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it may be. I mean, wasn't it Hawking who said in an infinite universe every event has a probability one of having happened an infinite number of times? If the probability is not a set of measure zero, yes. Yeah. But the question is, is life a set of measure zero? Is English well, a set of measure zero? Well, it can't be, because here we are. Oh, I think everything that happens is impossible. So, again, example, you have Sorry, a... did I hear you right? Yes, yes, Everything that happens is impossible. Yes, I think so. Uh, I, I need so, a phrase book to help me with so that. So here's a, you have take zero and one, there's a, there's a, and you put an electron there. You have an electron as a wave packet. The wave packet has a peak. And that peak, you could possibly, needs to be described by an infinite number of digits. It has an exact position. I know in, epistemologically, you have an uncertainty principle, which has, gives you some uncertainty. But in Hilbert space, it has an exact position. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, then the probability of that electron being exactly where it is is zero. So if it's true of an electron's position, it's true of everything's position. So everything that happens is zero. That's how I would argue. What would you say to that? I'd say you're playing games again. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, there's an electron in this plant right here. Yes. And, it, and it's clearly there. Yeah. I may not be able to tell you yes. exactly where it is. Yeah. yeah, I know that. I know it, but, obviously. Yeah. But that doesn't mean it's it will ever be an exactly... I don't know why. So the point is, do you think there's an, uh, an, exact electro an electron exactly like that somewhere else in the universe? And it might be... Who was it that said <laughs> they knew why all the electrons in the universe had the same mass? It's because they were all the same electron. That's Feynman. Was Feynman, 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 Feynman going backwards and forwards in time. Yeah, yeah. All right, so uh, are we alone? I don't... I haven't gone anywhere that would change my original answer. And what is your original answer? My original answer was, if we're going to uh, say, does life in some form that we hope we recognise exists somewhere in the universe or even galaxy, I'd say, yeah, it probably does exist and hence we're not alone. Is it a technological being that I would find interesting to talk to? That's a lot more problematic. So you use I, the... I would hope that they exist, but it's not at all clear. You use the word life. Now, I don't know what that means. What, what does it mean to you? Well, you can run through the various definitions that you know, the people give, it's got to be able to reproduce, which, you know, doesn't mean that a mule isn't alive, for example. Or a grandmother. Yeah, yeah. Or um, self-reproduce is often used. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it has to metabolize its environment into, the, into parts of its body. Metabolize its environment. A, useful, a very useful definition that rules out most of the pseudo examples or the counter examples that are given. Like a fire? Yeah, although f I'm not sure about fire. Probably... It's not clear that it has a body. It's just, it's. Uh... But yeah. I okay. But how about viruses and prions? I uh, can't talk about either because they're not my area. Okay. I couldn't talk authoritatively. Okay. Your area is stars. Are stars alive? I would be inclined to say no. Why? Well, they don't reproduce for a start. The stars are born and they die, and yes. they. And when your star goes boom, it produces all the kinds of elements and that, that's spread out into the environment as Indeed. new information. That changes the ability of the molecular clouds around them to collapse again. And so they are, information is being put into the environment. And that information then changes the next generation. So uh, It's not clear that it's really the 
progeny of a star well, has, induced has used the, proge the, the, the death of the star to do it. Used the death of the star. So yeah, the children, elements of the, so the children obviously the use their mothers to get reproduced, right? Yeah. I'm not sure it's a profitable way of thinking, but I, I, I like it as a, uh, a provocative question. <laughs> Which is your style. But, you, but you're not willing to go there and, uh, and no, keep your sense of no. rationality. I'm not, uh, I'm not sure, but almost every fibre of my being says to consider a star alive would just be wrong. And not morally wrong, uh -huh. but, right, right. but, but it's not a, useful. Is that because there's information that, the, that is passed on from one generation to another is not incorporated in the star, but is incorporated in the environment? Well, let me be Charlie Limeweaver for a minute and say that some of that information is, and the chemical abundances have changed, and there's information in that. Mm -hmm. Now, it may not be a lot of information. You've got a, an, an atom of sodium. It doesn't tell you where it started or... Presumably the first life didn't have a lot of information to pass on either. Yeah, yeah. So, I, don't, I wouldn't call it alive, but I can see that it's uh, an, interesting, an interesting question for people who haven't got something more pressing to do. Now, let's suppose that in uh, 10 years or 20 years or 100 years, we do find aliens that, of some kind. Uh, would that have changed you in any way? What's the big deal? So what? Well... I expect I'd still go to work and come home every day, but I think I'd be a much more inquisitive and happy individual. Even if they're microbial? Absolutely. What if you couldn't talk to them? You can't talk, it's hard to talk to microbes, and so you said... I didn't that say that was the only value. <laughs> you said if I could have my fantasy okay, of what okay. sort of uh, alien okay. would it be. Uh, I'd be very happy if we find a, found a microbe that had evolved independently of life on Earth. That would be fantastic. How would you define independence? If it evolved from the same chemical abundances, which are pretty no, much... No, if, if, it, if, it, if it hadn't had a causal connection with what happened on Earth. So it wasn't connected to the Big Bang. I knew you were going to say that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, no, it would be part of the universe and hence so connected to the Big Bang, okay. but uh, not, not having evolved on the Earth, shall we say. Oh, so like the life forms on the Earth might have come from Mars and so they... They're not part of life. They're not life, then. I'm not sure I said that. If, uh, if so we... Not we, having evolved on there, so it's possible that life on Earth could have come from Mars. Oh, life on Earth could have come from right. some way that we don't know about. Right, right. That's true. But we don't know that for sure. No. And if you can show me something that evolved on Mars, if, if you get a, a microbe on Mars and you have a look at it and it looks exactly like a microbe on Earth, I'd say, aha, chances are they're not independent. Well, exactly like is an interesting question, but if it had this opposite chirality, for example, you might say, oh, that's... That, that would be pretty interesting. Okay. Uh, that, to me, would indicate that it was independent. And again, you just have to accept that till the man gets here with the phrase book. And if we find opposite chirality of life on Earth, then you would not be willing to jump to the conclusion that it was independent, I bet, so readily. No, I probably wouldn't. Okay. I'd have to think about that. Or okay. I'd have to ask a biologist or a chemist <laughs> who knew more <laughs> about it than me. So are there any other questions I should ask you about Are We Alone that I've missed? No, uh, I don't think so. Something that you tell your students that uh, you haven't just said? Presumably you have many hours of lectures to your students, and so we've just talked for a half an hour. We haven't said everything. We miss, we've missed a lot, I'm sure. We have. Uh, that's, that's inevitable. You could talk... You can talk forever in this subject and not go very far because one of the things that one of the things that the students don't like is they want to know what they have to memorize for the exam and i would like them to think that they have to learn they should be able to argue an argument from both sides no matter what they emotionally believe they should be able to give arguments to say yes we're alone or no we're not because at the moment, I don't think we know enough to be confident of one or the other. So you should be able to marshal arguments for both. And that's, you know, the rare earth hypothesis is uh, frequently used uh, to explain why we may be, uh, may be alone. And it's not immediately obvious to me that that's wrong. Um, and until we know, until we can quantitatively estimate these things, 
it's very hard to give an answer that's reliable. So I think I'd like students to understand both sides of most of these arguments, or at least understand what we're certain of, or pretty certain of, which is very little, really, and, uh, and what are the possibilities given what we know. Okay, what about your guilt at exposing students to the science of evolution and undermining their religious values? I don't feel any guilt about that. I'm teaching them science. I'm not, not in charge of their religious views. Well, for example, uh, some g geneticists at Stanford wanted to sample all of the genes of all the people around the world. And, uh, and they asked Mick Dobson, who's a representative of some of the aboriginal cultures, and he said, no, you can't do it. And I think the, the logic behind there is, if you use our genes to find out where we came from, that will se probably severely undermine all of the uh, Genesis myths of all the people in Australia, all the Aboriginal people. And so, so he says, no, you're not going to do it because you're going to benefit from the scientific knowledge, but you're just undermining our traditional values. So what, what do you think of that uh, moral conundrum? Which you're participating in, if there are any people there, for example, who are, who are strongly... I don't know, Catholic or Protestant or some... Well, if, if their religious view is such that they can't accept a sci scientific inquiry, then they shouldn't be doing a science degree. Mm -hmm. sci uh, I mean, all we're doing is teaching them... So they should give up their pagan ways as soon as they enroll in a science class? No, but if they believe strongly like that, they probably shouldn't enroll in the science class. I think, I think that's what I said. That's what I meant. Okay. Um, as a colleague of mine once said, science isn't the only way to answer questions. It's been shown to be the best way to answer most questions. Mm -hmm. And if you, if, if one is of a belief that science is contradictory to the way you think about the universe, then I don't think that they should be studying science. They're obviously not open to that. Now, E.O. Wilson is a biologist who studies ants at Harvard, and he has talked about the connection between, or the conflict, often between science and religion. And uh, he says that every time there's a conflict, you know, science wins. Um, and, so, uh, and so he kind of, he says, science is after the truth. But I, I was saying, if, if he were a real biologist, he would know that his brain was something that evolved not to seek the truth, but to seek to be useful, to, to seek useful truths, but any unuseful truths they, you avoid because that's what your brain is, has evolved to do. Mm -hmm. So there's this conflict between, you know, there's useful things and there are truthful things, and the truthful but unuseful things would something that would, uh, would not be, I guess, investigatable by a brain that was selected to only look for useful things. Any comment on that? Yeah, um, two, I think, although I was also once read that you should never say you're going to make n comments because if you get halfway through <laughs> and you forget, <laughs> okay. you've just proven you All can't right, count. Two. I'll keep reminding you, two. Two, right. Well, um, and I'm going to go into more detail about the first, so I'm not sure. Oh, no, I remember the second. I'll get the second one out of the way first. The second one is, uh, the, the, an interesting question is why our brain has evolved to be so good at abstract things when a lot of the things that our brain is really very good at are not really fundamental to helping you get through the day. Really? Like, for example? Uh, we're pretty good at abstract things like mathematics. Mm -hmm. And from an evolutionary point of view, mathematics, it's an advanced skill that you don't really need to uh, get enough food to get through really? the day. Stephen Jay Gould talked about how writing and reading is a byproduct of evolution. Or, or, yeah. and, and therefore, it's a spandrel St. Marco, I think, was what he talked about. And... Uh, so he said, oh, reading and writing, I mean, writing is only 5,000 years old, therefore it could not have evolved under selection pressure. But that seems like a silly argument to me because obviously you need visual acuity and dexterity to do these things, and those things that, which are underlying the ability to read and write are certainly pr could be seen as products of selection. Sure, but that's different to saying that selection's Mathematical, is responsible for reading and writing. Well, it's he like wanted, your argument about English. Yeah. You know, English is unlikely to evolve a second time, but language is likely. You think so? If you have something like us, if you, okay, if, if you, if you replay life and you get through to Homo sapiens again, you'll probably get a language. I mean, I'm not saying that you would do that, but if you get to there, uh -huh. you'll probably get a language. It may not, may right. not get any of the languages that are around today. All right. I interrupted you. You said the yeah, second Yeah, the other thing first. I was going to say is you, you're basically making um, the argument 
which I, I, I give to, uh, I make students aware of during my lectures on pseudoscience, the utility versus validity argument. Mm -hmm. And um, a psychologist, uh, a friend of mine in Toronto, who was also a member of the skeptics there, he said that if you ask the average person on the street, is astrology correct? They'll say yes, meaning that it's valid, meaning that it's useful. Mm. If you ask an astronomer, they'll say no, meaning that it's invalid. Now, you can actually prove that it's invalid. A friend of mine did a double-blind test of astrology, which was published in Nature, and showed that there was zero correlation between a person's birth time not just a star sign, but actually their, 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 their full detailed chart, and a personality test that the, the um, astrologers had agreed was correlate, that they were able to predict. You don't mean zero correlation, you mean no correlation above random? Yes, yes. And, um, but that doesn't mean that astrology isn't useful to people. If having an astrological chart or a tarot card reading or having your palm read makes you think about decisions that you're making in life, it can be very useful to people. But that doesn't make it valid. Right. But I was criticizing E.O. Wilson for thinking that science is about truth rather than about use, utility. That was what the critic criticism Yeah, I, I tend to say that it's more interested in, in finding the truth than finding things that are useful. So you're non-Darwinian what, then? What we... You're non-Darwinian. I just accused you of being a non-Darwinian. Do you plead guilty? Why? Because you said you're... Science is about finding the truth rather yeah. than about useful truth. What's that got to do with Darwin? You, well, Darwin says that your brain evolved to find useful things, not truthful things. Truth has nothing to do with your brain. Yeah, but is, isn't it exaptation where you use something that evolved for one purpose for another? Well, it's always useful. It always comes back to utility and selection. Yeah, the ability, but you're now confusing science with the ability to do science, aren't you? Just like you were confusing English with language. Maybe I am. The ability to do science is something that evolution's produced. But there are a lot of people on the planet, and very few of them are doing science. In fact, I'd say a lot of practicing scientists aren't doing it very well either. Okay. <laughs> that's that's right. just a couple of colleagues that I won't name.